The Sony a7 IV is an awesome camera, and I think that's a pretty objective just fact at this point, but also, Pretty much every camera is awesome now, no matter what the brand or the model is, everything's amazing. But several months ago I did a review on my Sony a7 IV, and while I gave it a good review, I was kind of a little lackluster, like it was fine, but I wasn't super excited about the camera. In the time since I've made that review, and now that I've had the a7 IV for almost a year, I've really come to appreciate this camera in an entirely different way, so I think it's very important to have a follow-up on that initial review so I can share my new view with you. So definitely check out the full review if you want all of the specs and more detailed info on how the a7 IV compares to cameras like the FX3 and the a7S3. For today, there are a few key things that I wanna focus on focus, focus on with this camera that have really helped me to come to just love this camera over the past few months. And I think it's important to fire up this conversation by talking about overheating. I did talk about that in my full review and I was able to make the a7 IV overheat several times by putting it in really not ideal circumstances. But for me and how I use the camera, which is usually 4K24 or 4K30 sometimes, the camera has never overheated on me. I don't usually film 4K60, which is when it's more prone to overheat for extended periods. Usually when I'm doing 4K60, it's to get really short clips like slow motion, B-roll or something like that. In my normal recording modes, it is never overheated. Even one day last week, I think it was almost 110 degrees Fahrenheit outside and I left the camera out to do a time lapse. And then I came in here and started working on stuff and forgot it for an hour and a half. <laughs> And when I went outside to get it, it was completely fine. It was a little bit warm, but it was still recording like a champ. I got this very long time lapse of a palm tree, so that's cool. But I was really impressed that even in that situation, it didn't overheat. And for what it's worth, I did have the screen open at that time while it was doing the time lapse. So overheating hasn't been an issue for me, and I think that's important to mention because if you're somebody who wants to do 4K60 for extended periods of time, this is probably not the camera to get because that's when it's going to start overheating if you need like an hour of 4K 60 or something like that. But also, if you really wanna do only 60 FPS, it's probably not the camera for you anyway because it does have that 4K 60 crop. But since that crop has cropped up in this conversation, let's talk about that because for me, again, just for me and how I use the camera, it has not been an issue at all. I guess I should probably give some more context first because as I was using this as a studio camera, my FX3 is my main camera, absolutely amazing. My a7S III is my second camera, also absolutely amazing. And then I got the a7 IV to be a third camera and to be a photo camera. Because even though both of these cameras can take great still photos, those 12 megapixel sensors can be very limiting if you wanna do things like crop in on your photo or do some crazy compositions in Photoshop or something like that. But for whatever reason, as much as I appreciated that, yeah, this seems like a good camera, I wasn't like in love with it when I got it. I thought it was fine. And to be totally honest with you, there were a few times there where I was kind of thinking maybe I should have just gotten another a7S III or something as a third camera. And I'm so glad that I didn't because the a7 IV, it's, it's, it might be called the a7 IV, but to me it's, it's number one. And so where this really started to shine for me was when I started using it sort of out in the world more. The thing with my other two cameras is because they are my main two cameras for like my job, I'm very protective of them. They're incredibly expensive, not that this is an inexpensive camera at $2,400, but the FX3 and the A7S III are like $4,000 cameras. And if I'm just going out and doing something that's kind of like for fun, like we're going on a trip or something that I just wanna take photos and videos and I'm not really sure what I'm even gonna do with them, I'm very hesitant to take these cameras because if something were to happen to them, it would really have a hugely negative effect on me being able to do a lot of work that I need to do. It's not that I would want anything bad to ever happen to the a7 IV, and even though it is still an expensive camera, since it is less expensive to those ones, and for me it's less mission critical, I'm much more comfortable just taking this everywhere, which is now what I've done with it. I've just started taking this camera with me anytime we do anything. And seeing this camera in that new light is what has helped give me an entirely new appreciation for the a7 IV. Because it's basically the perfect camera to have with you in a situation where you need to cover a little bit of everything. You need to do some video, you need to do some photos, and have something that's reliable that gives good results. I mean, this is definitely the way to go. So now going back to the crop factor, the 4K60 crop, like I said, it has not been an issue for me. I actually forgot that the camera even had it. Because 
In my own workflow, when I'm using 4K60, like I said, it's usually to get a slow motion clip. Maybe I'm doing a video and I wanna get a slow motion B-roll clip of a product or something, so I'll have a little product there, put it in 60 FPS, and then get a little slow motion clip. 60 is not as nice as 120 is like on these cameras, but it definitely gets the job done. Or more often than not, if we're out doing something somewhere and I just wanna get a really cool little quick shot to add into like a vlog or a video or something, that's when 4K60 comes in handy. And for some reason, the crop just hasn't been an issue for me at all. If anything, it's usually been helpful because I'm typically using a prime lens and having the crop kind of gives this fixed focal length a new, a different focal length. So it kind of adds some variety. So yes, in a perfect world, I would love full frame 4K60 with the ability to crop in if I wanted to. But I also understand that with that high resolution 7K sensor that's in this camera, having full frame 4K60 or 4K 120 would present a lot of overheating issues for the camera. So if you're somebody like me where 4K60 is just a supplement to your workflow and not the main thing that you do, that crop and those limitations probably aren't really going to be an issue at all. But additionally, as we're talking about crop because we do have a 7k sensor you do have the ability to go into a super 35 crop so what i've done is just assign that to this joystick right here and now when i have a scene and i want to crop in i just push this joystick button and then the camera crops in 1.6 times i think it is for super 35 which is great if i'm using like a 24 millimeter lens what's 24 times 1.6 it's 38.4 there we go. Now my 24 millimeter lens becomes like a 38 millimeter lens. And then because like most Sony cameras, this has clear image zoom, I can crop in and then I can even go 1.5 times further. So that way this, what is that? What is, what's 38 times 1.5? The answer is 57. Hey, so now my 24 millimeter lens is like a 57 millimeter lens, you know, asterisk. At some point, I do want to get a zoom lens to use with this camera. I'm very interested in the newly announced Tamron 20 to 40 2.8. That seems pretty awesome. But even using just a 24 millimeter prime fixed focal length, because of the crop and the clear image zoom, there's so much versatility even just with this one lens on the camera. And as is the case with most Sony cameras, like I mentioned, I just assigned that feature to this joystick because Sony's really good about essentially letting you map basically anything to any button for the most part. Like I mentioned in my full review, what is typically an exposure compensation dial up here is now a fully assignable button with a great clicky, listen to this. So what I've done is I've actually set this to be my audio so I can turn this to adjust the camera's audio and when I have it at the level I want, I can lock it so that way it doesn't actually get changed. And that is super helpful if I'm not using a mic that has auto audio gain. But I did recently get this microphone, the Sony ECM B1M, which does have auto gain so then I don't need to worry about this at all. But that ability to customize everything is a huge advantage to this camera because it does take things even further and I didn't really understand or appreciate that until I was using this camera more and more and more and it it started to kind of click because one thing I was doing was clicking this mode dial. If you're familiar with this camera, you're probably aware that the mode dial is a little bit different than it is in other cameras. You do have your typical settings on top, like manual and some of the automatic and semi-automatic modes. And then you also have one, two, and three custom functions. And then you have this little sub switch here that lets you go from photo, video, and slow and quick modes. Even though I thought this is a nice little design, it didn't really seem that much better or that much faster or more convenient than just turning a mode dial. Is going like this, really that different than going like that if I wanna to go to slow and quick mode. What I didn't realize to full effect was that every mode then has three custom settings right here because you have three different shooting modes each with three different custom settings. So for example, in photo mode, you could have one custom setting be slow shutter speed, one custom setting be fast shutter speed. In my video mode, I have, what do I have? I have the first one, is set to kind of my standard settings at 4K24. My second one is 4K30 because a lot of times when I'm doing streaming, my equipment like the A10 Mini just works better with 30 frames per second, so I can easily just switch between 24 and 30 frames per second. But slow and quick mode is where, oh my gosh, this has changed everything. What I'm constantly doing is going between 
60 FPS to get little slow motion clips, and then super slow, like one FPS to do time lapses. And instead of going through the menus, now I just have in the slow and quick setting, setting one is a slow time lapse, one frame per second with each exposure being 0.8 seconds. And that way I can just flip it to that and then maybe make a couple adjustments for exposure and then I'm ready to do a really fun time lapse. Custom setting two, I have set to 120 FPS in just full high definition. So that way if there is something happening where I really need 120 FPS, Yes, even though it's not 4K, at least I can still get it and it scales up just fine to 4K. And then my third setting is just the standard 60 FPS slow motion, which is also what usually just the manual settings are set to. So that's why I put it to number three, because typically if I'm in manual mode and I switch to S and Q, I'm at 4K 60. But if for some reason I'm not and I wanna get there, I can also just go to number three. And just real quick, if you've ever been unsure of how to set these settings, you just put the dial into the setting that you wanna save. And then once you have your settings, how you want them to be, you just go into the camera menu and then option number four says, what does it say, shooting mode. <laughs> and then you can just arrow over to camera set memory. And that way you can select up here, it says one, two, or three. And then you just set which one of those you're going to save these settings to. So it's a super simple process, which means you can change these settings really easily if you're out and about and you decide you need to fine tune it a little bit more for something specific. But it's also super important to talk about photos because that of course is a huge strength of this camera and it is one of the reasons that I originally bought the camera and it is absolutely incredible to have a high resolution, amazing, stills photo camera with you at all times. And again, that's where I can't emphasize enough that even though the FX3 and the A7S3 with their 12 megapixel sensors can take really, really nice photos that you can print and blow up to pretty decent sizes, this, especially if you're somewhere where you can't recreate something, you're on a vacation, it's kind of like a once in a lifetime moment that you wanna capture, Capturing it in higher resolution, I think is definitely a smart thing to do and gives you a lot of versatility afterwards. Been using this PGY Tech Mantis Pod. I might even do a whole video on this thing because this is one of the coolest things ever. I absolutely love it. So I usually use this as like my little run and gun travel tripod setup thing, which is also very fun because it can easily go low to the flow if you need it to. And of course, if you've seen anything about this little tripod, it has like a hook that comes out and lets you hang it off of stuff. It's, it's really versatile and it works incredibly well. And then I just pop this little microphone on here. And now this setup will cover almost everything I need it to do. I can get great video, I can get great sounding audio, and then I also have the versatility to position the camera pretty much anywhere that I might need to. And so it really just has been so much fun to know that this very small compact setup, which could even be smaller, can cover like everything that I need for the most part, especially if I'm not in this very controlled environment. But of course it wouldn't be fair to talk about all the great things about this camera without talking about the strengths of the other cameras. I do cover this very in depth in my full review, but just to kind of give you the spark notes version, the other two cameras, the FX3 and the A7S3 have no overheating to worry about at all. I live in the desert, it's insanely hot here. Neither of them have ever come close to overheating, but especially, of course, the FX3 does have that built-in fan, so it will absolutely guarantee that even at 4K 120, for however long your memory cards will last, you're not gonna deal with overheating at all with those cameras. And again, you have no crops, so you have 4K 120, you have 4K 60, full frame, everything, no crop. You don't have Super 35 mode though, so you can't crop in as much. You do have clear image zoom though. The FX3 recently got a new 2.0 firmware update, which did kind of change it a bit to differentiate it from the A7S3. So the image quality is the same between these two cameras, but some of the menu functionality and some of the features are geared a little more towards video now. And it also added some new picture profiles and shooting modes as well. So it is absolutely a super strong, dedicated video camera. And I do have to say the FX3 and the A7S3 do both both have slightly better build quality than the a7 IV. The a7 IV is great and it looks so much like the a7S III, but like I've talked about before, there's something about this area here that just feels a little bit like, if you can kind of hear how that sort of sounds like hollow and plasticky, it's probably not something you would ever notice unless you use like the a7S III, which feels exactly the same, but is just like sturdier. I don't know what the reason is or what the change is or what. This is not like a poorly built camera by any means, but the other cameras do just have slightly better build quality overall. But as you would probably naturally expect, the a7 IV reminds me a lot of an episode of King of the Hill from the late 90s. 
<laughs> if you never watched King of the Hill, it's an amazing show. It's one of my favorites. But there's an episode in that show where Hank needs to get a new truck. He has this old red pickup truck that he's loved forever, and it's just time to get a new one, but he really doesn't want to. This has become one of my favorite analogies for learning to love new gear because it's so relatable. At one point in the episode, Hank ends up kind of being tricked into test driving a new truck and he needs to use it to go look for Bobby, his son, who's run away and it's a dark rainy night. And as much as Hank is really not that interested in this truck at first, as he goes out to search for his son, he starts to like fall in love with the truck because he starts to see how practical it is, how useful it is. It just sort of works for him in a way that he could only discover after he needed to use it in those specific scenarios. I love this truck. Yeah, me too. But when we get back to the dealership, pretend you hate it. For me, the A74 is that new red truck. It's the camera that I thought was fine, but it wasn't until I really started using it in these specific situations where all of these little features and these little quality of life improvements and these little kind of unique advantages that this camera specifically has started to shine. And that's when I started to think that I had been totally kind of wrong about this camera and didn't give it the credit that it deserves. So the whole point in this long endeavor is just for me to go on the record as saying that the a7 IV, absolutely amazing camera. And if you're thinking about getting one, but you're kind of on the fence, maybe this can sort of help you make that decision. Of course, this is all just from my own point of view and my own use case. So it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be perfect for you as well, but it's just so good. It's just such a good freaking camera. And speaking of things that are also friggin' good, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And I did put together a special playlist of my Sony camera review trilogy if you want to see full reviews for any of these three cameras.